repeat my opening remarks, oil on the water, oil in habitats, oil on birds, fishing seasons closed, uh, shrimp harvest closed, oyster industry in economic distress, recreational beaches closed. These are the normal manifestations of oil reaching land and the ones that are of most interest and most attention to the people that, uh, that are impacted, both directly in the area and those whose e economic well-being or quality of life well-being depends on those resources. Behind the scenes, particularly in Louisiana, is a longer term issue of oil reaching the shore, oil reaching the wetlands, and not only what is the impact on the oysters, the fisheries, the shrimp, the birds, but what is the impact of the oil on that fragile geologic system, which if further diminished, has long term, and I mean very long term impacts on the very resources that have been impacted in the short term. So I'm going to focus today, I think, on first our perception of oil on the shore, and this is the ugliest kind of thing that people envision, and I think what the press is anticipating when it talks about disasters and ecological disasters is, is gooey oil washing up on the beaches. And if we go back to Prince William Sound, the Three Mile Island of the oil industry in, in that day, uh, there are visions of, of huge massive cleanup efforts where in this case steam and chemicals were used to wash the oil from a very rocky coast. The oil was then collected and hauled off. So this is the visual image that most people have of oil on the beaches and oil being cleaned up once it gets there. But Louisiana and the Gulf Coast isn't Alaska. It's not the rocky coast of California. It's very flat-lying, uh, very lush, green, near sea level vegetation expanses. What happens when oil reaches those systems, those natural systems? Well, will it reach those systems? We're all anticipating that this oil is going to wash ashore in massive quantities. That it's going to string itself out on the beaches of Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. That it's going to wash into the wetlands. And these NOAA spill trajectories that have been projected each day show where the oil uh, may move given its present disposition and its present movements. We in Texas, of course, are worried about how much of that oil is going to come west and how much of it is going to end up on our beaches and in our systems. And you can see that uh, little blob of blue uh, nearing, moving to the west. In fact, that blob of blue got lost and disappeared. It never made it this far. But each day and each, uh, each time, there, is, there are new projections by NOAA of where the oil spill is and where it will be. If you want to see where it really is and what it's really doing, at least at the surface, you need to talk to Gordon Wells from the Center for Space Research because they are imaging the surface on, on a, a real-time basis and have information about its disposition. So we assume then that the oil will reach those red areas and that it will reach the beaches, but in fact it hasn't done it yet. So whether it is an environmental catastrophe or not is a thing to be determined in the future. The revelation uh, to some in the past few days that much of that oil isn't even making it to the surface. It's staying within 30 or 40 meters of the sea bottom. Brings a whole new dimension to this. Is that good news or bad news? Uh, is it less of a risk to ecosystems at those depths or is it more of a risk compared to what if it gets to the surface and gets into systems? If it gets into the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico and then begins to drift to the east, that certainly isn't good news. but in terms of quantity and dilutional factors, is it a significant contaminant of the loop current? We don't know. So the scientific community, true to our, our cause, uh, answer to this is give us more money because we need to do more research. Well, they're absolutely right. I mean, there's an awful lot about where the oil is, where it's going, and where it's going to end up that we don't know. And the monitoring that takes place from space and in situ is our key to tracing it and understanding it better. And as Tad pointed out, in the subsea, as we look at these gas and oil mixtures in the sea column, we need to understand that as well. Louisiana is uh, poor Louisiana. Uh, the wetlands that so much of their economy is dependent on, not only for the wildlife and biologic productivity that is of commercial value, but also for the oil and gas industry that has a lot of infrastructure and oil and gas wells in the wetland, is losing those wetlands at an astounding rate for a variety of causes. Uh, some is nature. 
land subsides, sediments are not being d delivered there anymore because they're being trapped upstream, so we don't have a natural system that's robust. Add to that, we've dredged canals, we've drilled wells, we've, we've taken s fluids out of the subsurface, we've put commercial activities into the wetlands, so we're tending to destruct, not construct the wetlands in a normal sort of regime. And there's been much written and much studied, uh, many studied aspects of this wetland loss, not only why, but what will it do to the long-term productivity biologically and, and in a sense geologically to this part of a very, uh, very fragile and, and critical coast. This is an alarming map uh, for many people. If you look at South Louisiana and you look at the red areas here, we've lost this much wetlands by these processes I just described uh, uh, since the 1930s up until 2000. There are projections of what additional wetland loss will take place by the processes that are operating today uh, in the next few decades. It's not a very pretty picture. It's not a very encouraging picture. And there's been a lot of effort spent on whether we can stop this loss by bringing sediment into the wetlands, by building new deltaic lobes, by arresting this destructive processes, and a lot of debate over whether it can happen or not. You can see in this, this particular slide that some of the areas here in red are near those areas in red on the NOAA projections where more oil could go. And so it would be entering a very threatened and a very stressed sort of uh, set of conditions already. The most significant factor and the most publicly viewed factor that impacts the wetlands is the one that we can see the most dramatic effects of. And we only have to go back to Hurricane Katrina on August 29th of 2005 and see that in addition to these everyday kinds of destructive forces on the wetlands, we have the impact of a hurricane and that impact can be very dramatic. If you look at this area of western Louisiana in June at the top and after Hurricane Katrina at the bottom, you can see the amount of seawater that can be pushed on shore and the effect that it can have on wetland systems, essentially wiping them out. If we move over towards the Bird's Foot Delta, again, below pre-Katrina, above post-Katrina, the force of that hurricane on weakened wetlands is tremendous and we lose significant amounts. If we take this particular area of the delta complex and look at the before to the left, uh, to your left, and the after Hurricane Katrina to the right, you can see that the impact of this could be serious, is serious, and very, very long lasting if these ecosystems don't recover. Is oil going to do anything like that? Are we going to see an impact on those ecosystems that causes them to disappear? And that's the long-term consequence that I'm raising today. If, in fact, the oil is toxic to that vegetation, number one, if, in fact, it gets there, and that's not a pre-gone conclusion, if it does get into the wetlands, how far will it be carried into the wetlands by normal tides and by normal currents? What will it do when it, when it gets on that vegetation that is the wetlands? Will it have a long-term effect and actually kill off the vegetation so that the next time there's a hurricane, that vegetation held sediment is no longer protected by the vegetation and it disappears and we lose incrementally a very large piece of this very productive biologic system because the oil added to the stresses that are already there, assuming the oil gets there, assuming that it has a long-term effect. We really don't know. And there hasn't been that much uh, postulated or said publicly about what the oil might do to those wetlands and if we look back into the history of oil spilled in the wetlands, it has happened before. There has been oil spills, have been oil spills from production facilities in the wetlands that have had limited effects. So there's been some study, but we really haven't addressed the whole issue. So how can you remediate oil in the wetlands to avoid the possible consequences of vegetation destruction, deltaic framework discussion? Well, again, depends on the wetland type, depends on the oil type. So are we talking about salt marsh, brackish marsh, freshwater marsh? Are we talking about heavy crude, light crude? Is it very volatile or not? Uh, those things haven't been brought forward at least yet. One way to do it is to burn it off. As soon as the oil gets there, burn the vegetation. Don't kill the roots, but kill the upper part. Get rid of the oil by burning it off so it can't be there and have a long-term toxic effect. You can use dispersants and cleaners. You gotta be careful though, because you're dealing with, with plants and animals and so forth, so you can't just uh, indiscriminately put things in there that might be efficient for the oil removal, but not so, not so good for the, uh, for the creatures. And phytoremediation, we all know about bacteria that are used to clean up oil, uh, gasoline and so forth. Are there, are there microbes and larger based organisms that could, could eat the oil and enjoy having oil for dinner? Uh, that's unlikely at the scale we're talking about. 
the, the, the interesting fact is that from the history we have of, of small spills within the wetlands, we know that it can persist for several years in the marsh soil. So if it seeps into those muddy, sandy sediments there, is that going to be a nutrient for the vegetation or is it going to be a toxic element for the vegetation that leaves it vulnerable not only for the next hurricane but maybe the one after that? So I think the large unanswered question in terms of the impact of a spill, if it reaches the wetlands, and again I have to say that if it reaches the wetlands, is unknown, but potentially much more serious is the long-term effect of affecting the vitality, the integrity of the delta itself than the most immediate and very serious impacts on the commercial fisheries, the commercial uh, ventures that take place in these wetlands. Those will pass if they survive, but will the structure of the delta survive? And we really don't know. Thank you.